For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson, and welcome to the latest readout video from our Wednesday Wake Up Newsletter, to which, as always, we encourage you to subscribe for lively discussion and for links to the research. And speaking of lively discussion and of links, I do want to mention that we're having an issue at the moment with links in YouTube comments, namely that if you include a link, the comment seems to vanish. And I want to assure you we're working on it and we're not banning links. We do ban vulgarity, conspiracy theories, and abuse, no matter the target. But otherwise, we welcome debate and suggestions. Which brings me to the first item in this video, because it's based on a suggestion from a reader, a reader with statistical training, that climate science should consider imitating a frequent best practice in medical research, which is having one person or group design an experiment, and then someone else, independent, check the data that they gather for significant trends. And moreover, they'll disguise the data in some way, reverse the time series, or do something else that masks its practical implications so that the red team has to look for abstract trends, not some coveted outcome. Which is exactly the way that NASA and others don't approach adjusting temperature to make sure it confirms the CO2 causes warming theory that they set out not to test, but to confirm. We're not against people making assumptions. All thought is about sorting through experience to see if it fits our expectations. But we're all prone to Kierkegaard's covetous eye on the outcome in every area of our lives, including professional, including science. So, when we have the time and the resources, it's always best to have someone check who doesn't have a dog in the fight, or if they do, can't tell which one it is, instead of, say, the usual suspects piling on whenever anyone raises inconvenient questions. And speaking of inconvenient questions, science long had an issue with the MIP in the LGP, which if you don't like TLAs, the letter acronyms, is a reference to the missing ice problem during the last glacial period. And the issue wasn't the BNP, the boring name problem, it was that more water seemed to be missing from the oceans than could be explained by the amount of ice they thought was in the glaciers. Now we hear a cry of Eureka from scientists and their computers saying, ah, the glaciers were smaller but formed faster than the settled science that led to those maps in your high school science class or those diagrams of your city under a mile of ice. Which also means that the oceans didn't go down as much as believed, so they didn't rise as fast when the Holocene started and the glaciers retreated. But now the scientists say they understand everything and can model it to bits, including how much the seas will rise thanks to the missing global warming problem. So the science is settled again. Until next time. And speaking of next time, John Kerry, who flew a million kilometers in three years to save the world from the effects of your use of motor vehicles, and who thinks we have nine years to save the planet, also thinks we have nine months, because the next GABFest, COP26, scheduled for November 1st to 12th of this year in Glasgow, Scotland, is, quote, this most critical moment where we have the capacity to define the decade of the 20s, which will make or break us to get to net zero carbon in 2050, end quote. And if not, well... Climate Groundhog Day, where the same alarm goes off next time, and the time after, and the time after, until he finally gets it right and hears of teleconferencing, and, dare we hope, the climate discussion nexus. There's more in the newsletter, of course, and it's bad news for the alarmists, from the finding that cannabis cultivation is a huge carbon footprint, to a claim in the conversation that, quote, solar panels in Sahara could boost renewable energy, but damage the global climate, end quote. Because it turns out that solar panels are really inefficient at generating electricity, but they're really efficient at absorbing heat. Plus, a comp computer model says, the extra heat brings more moisture that lets plants grow in the desert, and then they absorb more heat, and you get a runaway greenhouse effect that creates a barren jungle. Now, since you did a solar farm covering about 7% of Spain just to power Germany, and since the conversation authors were pondering covering 20% of the Sahara, uh, we're talking destroying the earth to save it here. Not that we could ever find enough minerals to build all those panels, but according to NASA, the planet continues to green ominously anyway, so we're all going to die, as usual. Even though the Biden administration is not just saving America from Donald Trump, it's saving the whole planet by raising the social cost of carbon from 8 bucks a ton to 51 and 1,500 and 18,000. Strangely round numbers there for methane and nitrous oxide, and an arbitrary one for CO2, as well as the others. Released by those noted climate scientists the Office of Management and Budget back on February 25th, while the noted climate scientist economist at Politico, and I mean here a sustainability editor with a degree in English literature, 
and an energy reporter with degrees in journalism, international relations, Jewish studies, and public affairs reporting, whined, quote, the administration stopped short for now of boosting the cost figure to higher levels that economists and climate scientists say are justified by new research, end quote. Oh yeah? Which economists? Which scientists? Which research? Never mind. The point is, if we raised it further, including by fiddling the discount rate, it would justify more drastic action, so we should. And don't take our word for it. The political article said openly that, quote, economists and environmentalists had pushed the Biden administration to fundamentally change the climate modeling that's used to calculate social costs in ways that would increase the figure and thereby make federal approval of fossil fuel projects harder to justify, end quote. That's climate science in action, folks. As is Michael Mann's new discovery that there really is no climate, that CO2 and aerosols explain everything, so forget messy ocean currents and all that stuff prompting Judith Curry to ask, quote, how does this stuff get published in a journal like Science, end quote, and then answer her own question with, quote, peer review is so broken, end quote. Meanwhile, over in our Scientists Say feature, scientists say net zero is a fantasy, as the world has been moving not away from, but toward fossil fuels. And, quote, historians of energy transitions are not surprised by this development, as history shows that neither the dominant sources of primary energy nor the common energy converters can be displaced rapidly and completely in short periods of time, end quote. So that's what scientists say, unlike, for instance, English majors. As for gypsy moths, in case you were wondering, they say yum yum to European oak trees. But from CO2 science, we learn that if CO2 levels rise, Quercus rober is better at fighting off Lamantria dispar even in the presence of Phytophthora pluervora. Uh, and that's not the main event in the forum. It's a joke where a tree, a moth, and a root pathogen walk into a lab, where it turns out that even a tree with root issues is better at dealing with a moth infestation if it gets lots of CO2, the famous plant food, yum yum. And also from CO2 science, it turns out that birds are not as vulnerable to changing temperatures as many had assumed, partly because they have things called wings that let them do a thing called flying somewhere better if local conditions deteriorate. Science in action. As always, if you're enjoying the videos, please do subscribe to the newsletter, send us comments and ideas, and send us money. For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson.